Hi, everyone. This is John Snyzen here for the Economic Truth Report, and this is uh, report number 32. Today, I'm, I'm very, very excited because I'm going to bring on someone that is somewhat of a renegade uh, banker, and just the amount of knowledge and understanding this guy has uh, just blew me away. I actually read his book, uh, which everybody needs to read. It's called The Great Taking, uh, and his name is David Rogers Webb. And uh, let me just tell you a brief, uh, quick introduction to him, and then he can introduce himself, of course. Uh, but David uh, Roger Webb has deep experience with investigative and analysis within challenging and deceptive environments, including the mergers and acquisitions boom of the 80s, venture investing, and public finan uh, financial markets. He managed hedge funds through the period spanning from the uh, extremes of the dot-com bubble and bust producing a gross return of more than 320%, while uh, the S&P and NASDAQ indices had losses. His clients include some of the largest institutional, uh, international institutional investors. Uh, so, David, uh, you know, welcome to the show, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to have you on. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's kind of get into it. I, I kind of like the just did this on uh, the kick because I had, uh, we, we got talking yesterday and um, I would just love to get your insight. So can you tell just a little bit more about yourself and like kind of where your background is? And then we'll get into the more important parts of, uh, of this interview. Well, I'm I'm an American and I'm living in Sweden, but uh, I grew up in Cleveland Uh which used to be a thriving city. A um, hundred years ago, it was like all of California in one place. All the industries were in, in Cleveland. Rockefeller's first refinery, the steel industry, the aluminum industry, the, uh, because of the, the oil, you know, the chemicals industry, uh, aeronautics, there was uh, the Cleveland Air Show was a significant thing. Um, and uh, when I was a boy, that was all still there when I was a, a young boy. But um, over the course of my childhood, things started going pretty badly. <laughs> and I, uh, I write about that in the prologue. Uh, so I come from a family of medical people and engineers. Uh, no one was in the world of high finance, um, but I, um, and I probably would have become a medical doctor, uh, but uh, during my teenage years, I things were going badly enough that I decided I needed to understand how business worked and what what was happening. So really that is the journey of my life has been uh, going into things to understand. Uh, it's not really about making money for me. Um, so I, I went to New York, for example, and worked on Wall Street, but it was really just following a process of, um, um, um sensing sensing something that I needed to know about. And then I I also, once I've done something, I don't need to keep doing it. Uh, it's 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 not about just punching the clock and collecting pay. I tend to move on to uh, uh, the next thing I I think I need to know about. Yeah, no, that's uh... It's kind of like when I when I was young as well. Like I always had this uh, urge to know everything about everything. Like I'm I'm very curious personality. So it's uh it's it's good to meet someone that you know you want to know uh, as much as you can about the world we live in. And it's uh, uh there's there's so much to know and understand. And uh, like I I don't know I I I just get excited about knowing new things and learning new things uh, all the time. And and I could kind of see where you uh, you know you have you know, the, the knowledge in a certain field and then be like, yeah, it's kind of boring here <laughs> now. And <laughs> and I see how you want to jump to the next one. I, I've done that a few times. And, and of course, uh, that has dragged me down this rabbit hole of where I'm at today as well. You know, after uh, reading books on finance and, uh, and the monetary system, and uh, I just got taken to, I just wanted to know everything that I could about it. And of course, I never 
never ended up going to any schools or anything for it. And uh, like with you as well, you really never took the financial route. As you said, you took the business route of things. Uh, and um, yeah, and, and you were building things for Wall Street, didn't you? Like you, you got into like, uh, you were quite uh, good on computers and stuff. So you, you built uh, certain things from, didn't you? Or I, I'm Yeah, forgotten. this was very early days when no one really understood anything about a computer you know in the the in my first um well th this is how old i am in in my initial training in university we were using punch cards punch cards yeah, yeah. programming and running programs and the <laughs> input so uh and then when i was in this mergers and acquisitions group we were using trs 80 Radio Shack TRS-80 computers. This is prior to the IBM PC. And they had these floppy drives that were nearly as big as, a, you know, as somewhere between a 45, you know, record and an LP in, in size. <laughs> these floppy disks. And I think they held a whopping 256K of oh, data. Pretty. On a floppy disk. <laughs> yeah. So in the in the department I was in, I actually spearheaded putting in the first networked hard disk, which was a totally new thing, with a whopping, mind-blowing five meg, five meg of capacity for the entire department. <laughs> Yeah, that that's the way I remember my first hard drive that I had in a uh, 386 computer. It was like four megabytes, but like that, you actually managed to network that hard drive at that time. That's pretty impressive. Oh yeah, this, <laughs> yeah. this, this was early days, and yeah. I mean, mainly, I mean, I did programming, um, but it was it was programming basically financial applications to um, interface where. The computer services firm I was with, the, the main product in, in New York, and this is what sent me into all these firms when I was basically a kid just out of school in New York, was something called uh, CompuStat, which was all the fundamental financial information. Um, so it, it allowed the investment banks to do screens. It was the first time you could do something like that. You could screen the whole database and find things with certain characteristics. And that was pretty advanced stuff back then. <laughs> yeah, that's like chat GPT of uh, like early type of that kind of function, right? Primitive. And this, this computer services firm is called CompuServe. And they were really the forerunner of a lot of things. They had something like email. It was all all the stuff you have on the internet now, but it was it was all it had to be run um, through the mainframes um, at uh, at CompuServe. And uh, anyway, it was yeah. early days. Things like that. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool to hear because it's uh, like I just got in when you like when you had the first like. The tinier floppy disks, you know, the last version before it kind of became obsolete. You know, you had the CD uh, that got evolved. And I, I remember my first computer at 11, you know, I was pretty excited uh, that my dad bought this computer and uh, and uh, also be able to go on the internet. I think I had like 9.6 uh, uh, kilobyte, you know, internet connection at the day. And it was, it was pretty amazing, you know, being able to uh, start using such an amazing tool. And ever since, I always have been amazed by the, the power of of that internet uh, and uh but yeah let's um let's get the, into some very interesting stuff uh that you talk about in your book the great taking uh and i i don't know if you want to start uh like talk a little bit about the great depression maybe and, and what happened then like if that is a, a good segue to then talk about actually what's going on today uh or or if you want to go into today and then go back uh, it's kind of up now, to you let me, let me come at, let me come at it another way which is um kind of a high level explanation of what we're talking about here and then maybe we'll go into specifics as you as you sure. what you'd like to ask about but i think what the the shocking thing that i'm really explaining is that um securities uh 
were personal property for centuries, always were. And um, so in if there was an insolvency of a custodian, it would have been illegal for them to take your securities. The, the firm would fail and you would say, well, here is where you can deliver my securities. If they didn't do that, that was outright theft and fraud. Um, and uh, so it was not a contractual claim. It was your property. Yeah. Well, derivative instruments and people, people are confused about what a derivative is. A derivative is just a financial contract. It's just something that is written and it's called a derivative because it's not the real thing itself. It is something that is describing the behavior of something else. So its features are derived from the behavior of something else. The price of tomatoes or an index going up and down or interest rates going up and down that re re results in payments from you know, one party to the counterparty based on the movement of this thing. Now that is clearly a contract and it has no collateral, didn't behind it. It was, it, it was a contractual claim in the event of insolvency. What has been done here is a very sophisticated sleight of hand to make the securities into a contractual claim so that what was property is now just a contractual claim and to give the secured creditors behind the derivatives complex a super priority right to take the collateral. So they've, they have subverted this by taking something that was property, not a contractual claim, making that a contractual claim and giving the thing that was a contractual claim super priority to the assets. Um, all this would have been illegal not long ago. <laughs> so, and just outright fraud. And uh, so how was this done? Uh, the first step, was to um, dematerialize securities, which was a process that began in the, uh, well, it really got underway in the early 70s, but the rationale for doing it was being put in place in the late 60s. And dematerialization itself is not the problem because for example, in Sweden, um, everything was in electronic book entry form, but you had specific identification to the security. So you knew who owned what, and they had property rights to those securities. But the, the dematerialization was a necessary precondition to fuzzing up who owns what and severing the property rights. So, um, Dematerialization came first, then in 1994, there was um, uh, very subtle work done to um, uh, subvert the property rights. And they did that by creating uh, a new concept. It had never existed in four centuries of securities law of the security entitlement. And that is what severs the property right and gives the, the beneficial owner, it's now called the beneficial owner, yeah. the appearance of ownership. And what, what they mean by beneficial ownership is that you have an appearance of ownership. You can buy it, you can sell it, you, you are paid the dividends, you get a proxy statement, but that is distinct from the legal owner. The legal owner is the entity that controls the property as collateral. And then um, all securities are held in on a pooled basis. Um, and uh, what, what that does, and I, I should mention, I, I show this in the book. Um, it's a very important document, this response from the Fed, the New York Federal Reserve to something called a legal certainty group in Europe. And this was occurring in 2006. 
Um, and the Fed, what's going on there, the legal certainty group is, is investigating how to make it absolutely legally certain that uh, the secured creditors take the customer assets in the event of insolvency. So they're asking the Fed how this works in the US. How, how is this done? Be, um, the, so this was first done in the U.S. by, uh, as I mentioned, changing the Uniform Commercial Code. This was done in all 50 states, and they they did it that way, I believe, because it it uh, could be done quietly. It took time, um, and uh, so it was implemented first in the U.S and then Canada and Britain. And then there was a process of um, really run by the US State Department to force this harmonization globally and uh, in, in Europe. So that's why the legal certainty group was undertaking this. So in the Fed's response, they make it clear that with this pooled nature of the securities, um, they they can be borrowed um, out and used as collateral. This is done free of payment, FOP, which means the collateral can be taken, customer collateral can be taken and used without any consideration given. And um, further that segregated accounts uh, are... Um, uh, only entitled to a pro rata share of what remains in the pool, just like all other clients. So segregation is something that it's basically a fiction. It is in the books and records of the custodian. Um, they're able to say, well, we're not mingling these assets with our own firm's assets. No, no, we wouldn't do that. But they're still in a pool with all the other securities. So they can tell, they can tell a sophisticated institution, oh, your, your securities are segregated. Um, but me, they can basically tell everybody what they want to hear. They, they, they can say, we're not loaning your securities out. But meanwhile, they're in a pool where the clear objective is to utilize these pools quite thoroughly. And there, there are a number of indications of that. They, they refer to the doctrine of self-help. There is, a, or long established practice of self-help. There, there, they can be borrowed without restriction out of these pools. There, in the book, there's also, um, I go into this Bank for International Settlements document that is showing all the plumbing to move the collateral from the collateral givers to the collateral takers, the collateral givers being custodians globally, even equity, even equities. So it's not just um, it's not just government bonds that uh, uh, they in in this same document they talk about. Um, collateral transformation that in the in um, uh, for example in a crisis it might be that there isn't enough um, high quality collateral uh, in the system so through collateral transformation um, equities for example can be swapped for so again customer pools of equities can be swapped for government bonds and then uh, uh, used as collateral in that way. And again, all of this ends up in the derivatives complex. So now whatever has been used in this collateral transformation is also encumbered in the derivatives complex. Um, yep. So, so there's this there's this flow uh, uh, that is is documented there, and there are uh, collateral management systems that are automated 
uh, to do this, particularly in a crisis. And the, the flow of the uh, collateral um, is to the central clearing counterparties. Now, this is the other thing that was done. It used to be that uh, derivatives contracts were bilateral. Uh, so so the, the participants knew who the counterparty was or what entity was the counterparty and could assess the credit quality of that counterparty. Then under the uh, guise of reducing risk, they actually created a monolithic, horrific monolithic risk because they forced um, central clearing of derivatives. So now there is no counterparty other than the central clearing counterparty under this massive derivatives complex. And um, uh, so it was done in the name of reducing risk. It provided the rationale for why they had to have all of this, all the all of the collateral globally, and sweep it in a crisis in an automated fashion. Um, uh, but the, the central clearing counterparties are themselves, I believe, set up to fail. They're very thinly capitalized. Um, the um, Depository Trust Corp in the US, which is the, this is where all securities in the US complex are held in book entry form. Um, um, pooled form. Um, uh, and then on top of that, you have the um, central clearing counterparties util utilizing that collateral. The, the entire capital, equity capital of Depository Trust Corp is only three and a half billion dollars. And then in, in documents, both in Europe and in depository trust, they are talking about this within the last two or three years, they're talking about the possibility of the failure of the central clearing counterparties. It could be triggered by the failure of one or two clearing members. Um, and that um, in, the, in the case of depository trust, they're saying, well, we don't think it's right to put more capital into the lost waterfall, as they call it. Uh, what we have done is pre-funded the startup of another central clearing counterparty. Now, what, what that would mean if the central clearing counterparty fails, uh, uh, and again, this will be in a, in a major systemic crash, um, the secured creditors take the collateral. Uh, that's where this is going. And this Fed document, the response to the legal certainty group also makes it clear that secured creditors of a um, clearing firm always have priority to the pooled assets. So it's um, now we get back to the depression. <laughs> which is, people would say, well, this is insane. Yeah. This, who would do that? This could not happen. <laughs> but the, 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 what I'm explaining is that this is what happens at the end of a, a debt expansion super cycle. And what we're in now is a globally synchronous debt expansion super yeah. cycle. And and but in the in the 30s, um, the 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 um, uh, I mean, there's plenty of evidence to see that things were done to precipitate the banking crisis and to make it much worse and to keep conditions very stressful for years. Um, and I've you know, 20 years ago, I was studying this in detail because that's when I saw that the ability to create growth by printing money was actually beginning to collapse then. 
This was over 20 years ago. So it's a, it's a long process. Um, but, you know, looking, I went down to the Cleveland Public Library and went through these chart books, all, all the equities, all the commodities. And what you, what you find is that um, the, the large majority of public companies cease to exist. So the equity layer is wiped out because you have a, uh, a dramatic price decline when the bubble that has also been made to happen is then burst and it takes everything down. So going through the commodities, every commodity, and I'm not kidding, every commodity went to a hard price low of the prior 60 years. With the exception of gold, gold was the only thing that didn't. Uh, gold fell, but then it then it then it recovered. But here's the other part of it: they then confiscated the gold mm -hmm. from the public. So the the public was unable to use their own gold to carry on economic activity. The the Fed it was all to be turned into the Federal Reserve. There's evidence that this was planned long ahead uh, uh, under, the, under the rationale that for the Fed to expand credit, it would have to take the gold. Uh, but then they didn't use the gold to expand credit. They kept conditions tight. So it's what I'm what I'm getting at here is that the the bubble and the bust and the drop in price level is intrinsic to the process of this kind of a reset in yeah. which their idea of a reset is we will have everything and you will have nothing yeah. and we'll start the game over again. So they, they do that through uh, taking things through debt, anyone that is indebted, but the innovation this time is the collateral backing is not gold, it is all securities globally. So the and they can take the the shocking thing is they so in the insolvency, they take people's assets. The 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 people or the institutions had never extended these as collateral. They own them outright, free and clear. It is uh, the insolvency of the entities that secretly use their collateral <laughs> that, yeah. that allows it to be taken. Yeah, actually, during uh, this is an interesting book. So uh, you know the the whole gold gold confiscation and what happened there in 1933. You had the Gold Act, uh, and yeah. with the Gold Act, they actually with the two billion dollars of confiscated gold, they actually you know they created the what's called the Exchange Stabilization Fund. Uh, yes. And and it's a uh, it's very interesting because it was used to just basically intervene in uh, in markets to stabilize the dollar because if one currency is starting to go a little wild and right you know it, it starts to get bad with other currencies right so they, they use that whole uh, uh, it's basically like a slush fund you know if the Canadian dollar is starting to struggle you know like oh we we can come and put some credit lines out to you through like uh, currently what they use in my opinion is. Uh, the swap lines of the Federal Reserve, which they basically extend out to central banks in order to help with, you know, instability in their currencies. Like they currently are off and on with, uh, who is it, the ECB, Bank of Japan, Bank of England, uh, the Swiss National Bank. They've been, you know, helping out lately. You, if, if you go on the Fed's website and watch this, they keep on extending these swap lines uh, when you see stress in the markets uh, to help try. Question, yeah, is, sorry. Is, is this really help? <laughs> Yeah. It's, <laughs> or, or is this just saying you need us to manage the economy? We're managing things. It's basically central planning. Oh, which yeah. Never, never works. It's at the expense of things, actually. It's all about control. It's, uh, and, and that is really, I think, behind what is happening here, there's a kind of continuum going back into the 19th century of um, central planning uh, that was behind, you know, Marxism, communism, socialism, national socialism, and really continued 
in Britain and increasingly in the US, which is the idea that individuals uh, cannot be allowed to determine their own reality. Someone has to someone has to plan that and I guess it'll be us. We will plan it. <laughs> yeah, it's basically a feudalist view of the world, right? Like they're still in that kind of terms when it comes to like central planning. They just look at themselves as way better than everybody else. And, and you know, we need to just make sure that your life is okay. Uh, and then you got like other, you know, parts of that central planning that comes from, you know, the Malthusian elite that runs, for example, organizations like the UN and, and others where they just, oh, it's like, it's way too many people. We can't control them all <laughs> type of scenario too. You know, the, the world, I, re I recently read Friedrich Hay Hayek's uh, Road to Serfdom which I think was my grandfather's book. It's oh, printed wow. in 1944. So Hayek wrote this even before the end of the war. And he's really concerned because he sees that Britain is continuing, that the leading thinkers in Britain are basically like the Nazis. They're, 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 they're yeah. the national socialists. So yeah. his concern was, oh, my God, we're going to win the war. But then you're going to run you're going to run the same program. <laughs> and um, well, it's it's uh, I'm forgetting what I was going to say about that. But, uh, well, you see, yeah, you see. So, ten yeah, go yeah. You see tendencies like that here in Canada now, actually. But Canada just reintroduced a program called the MAID program, which is assisted suicide. And they're actually pushing it now to more and more of the population. Oh, if you got some, uh, if you're a little bit depressed, here's a, here's a program for you. Or or if you're mentally ill, they're even been talking about. So it's like kind of those uh, ideas of that. Uh, there's a set, It's a technocratic. Like I, I have a book um, that was written by a guy that is the, uh, he's the head of, um, uh, the uh, what's called Group 30. I don't know if you ever heard about that group, but it's like it's kind of like a Bilderberg of bankers. Uh, but his name is Stu P. McIntosh. And he wrote uh, a book called The Redesign of the Global Financial Architecture, The Return of State Authority. Uh, and so that's kind of, you know, the, their views is that they're technocratic. He, he write, like, I don't know how many times he says technocratic in here, uh, but he's like technocratic epistemic elite you know, as a control, and they are, they created, you know, the financial stability board because we're going to have financial stability. And then we want to make sure that, you know, like if, if you ever seen, like I, I went to look at all the central bank's balance sheet uh, a little while, I think it was last year, but then you see started to pop up in every central bank's website is a financial stability report. And that actually comes from the financial stability board. And they think that they, uh, you know, through their, uh, you know, amazing understanding of things and their PhD uh, academics, uh, you know, uh, education that they they know how they can stabilize, you know, uh, basically a, a system that every time you uh, you create it, you know, the debt based system with interest on top of it, you always create a bubble at the end of it when everything is indebted. Uh, but they think that they can control it and they like they think that they're smarter than everybody else. But the problem is they're not. And they will fail. But again, you know, as you said, they will try to then reassert their power into the new system through when we have to reset when the, the like we were so indebted, like we we're in basically in everything bubble. Uh, and it's like, as you said, you know, it's global. Everybody has it. We never really had like a system where everybody just goes like this uh, in, in the whole wide world. We had a system where usually you be, used to be on a standard and then some rogue nation, you know, went off on a just a pure debt-based system and then kind of it went south over time. Uh, but this time it's 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 completely global. Almost every single country, I think it basically every single country in the world is a part of this thing. And especially the Western nations are incredibly indebted, but it's not only them, it's all over Asia. Like the, the major economies there are heavily indebted and there's really no exit strategy out of this massive behemoth of a, of a Ponzi scheme basically that they created. Uh, well, but they did that. I, it's by design yeah, that it yeah. form. There's no differentiated place where you can hide from it. But that actually is, in a sense, our um, hope for humanity. Oddly, so what? What I would say is, you know, we know divide and rule works very well. 
and uh, it's been used very successfully you know, um, between economic classes or if people are being hurt in one part of the world, other people don't care at all as long as their gasoline yeah. is cheap, you know. But in this case, they you can see how this is set up. They will hurt everyone, everywhere, all the way to the top of the economic system and at the same time. This is why I say this design it's intelligent, but it's insane. <laughs> it will not end well for the people. So totalitarianism always fails. That's what this is. And Hayek, he talks about this, that the real world is so complex, it cannot be centrally planned. It works much better if you have personal autonomy and small small uh governance small, structures yeah small government structures local determination yep. then, then you have the flu fluidity to reorganize and handle things um but uh once they begin with the central planning it has no limits and that's what we're seeing it will grow until the whole thing uh fails because uh, it just gets so bad, it fails. So, so that's that's the good news and the bad news is it's going to get that bad, yeah. and then it, then it will fail. Yeah, and the, the center of planning comes like from all the way back, and, and who knows? Maybe it's even later than our books could read. But you know, like the the Roman Empire had their edict of prices, where they had price controls. You know, and those failed miserably, like back in the day. And and now, like I'm listening to people here in Canada on local talk radio, or whatever, and they're talking about, oh, we need to control prices. You know, we need to stop this and that. And then what they don't understand is now they're going to create massive, uh, you know, uh, the the lack of supply of things because who wants to be able to provide a service that uh, basically is costing them more. Uh, but the government says that, oh, you have to sell it at this price. So now you're going to have an extreme like. Uh, you know, you know, lack of like basically shortages everywhere. Like that's all over Soviet Union back in the day. Uh, and so they're gonna try all these central planning, you know, schemes that they got going. The 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 lower levels of the political class, you know, because that's what they think it, it's gonna work. Oh, oh, tax the rich, you know, tax them like hundred like ninety six percent, like that. All of these ideas are coming out there. Uh, but again, you know, it comes back to that, the, the self-responsibility and, and, uh, you know, I, I, I like to propose some things to, uh, to people that want this, all this central planning. It's like, if you really want, just, if you just want a government to exist, I, I'm not a big uh, fan of massive government, but if you want a little government to exist, just have a little consumption tax. You know, if you want something that's really fair among the people. Uh, just tax a little bit of what they consume because we all consume uh, unequally because we have different uh, amounts of money. Uh, but in, instead, they're coming after, you know, that the income tax was created with the Federal Reserve Act, for example. Uh, and and it's it just like the, the whole taxation system itself is uh, is now basically supporting a lot of the interest payments uh, on, on all this debt that has been created. Um, and so... Uh, what you're seeing is is basically, uh, you know, all of these ideas of these central planners are kind of failing, but the, a lot of them don't understand what's happening, as you said, on the, the higher up level, which is, it, this is exactly what they plan, you know, the, the higher up people that's out there. And, and I don't know if you want to go into like kind of who, who these types of people are around the world uh, that, you know, are kind of on the top of the pyramid, if you want to. Uh, if we want to call it that, that you know, are the people that are kind of the 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 constructors of this type of system, and and maybe they, it was their forefathers that you know were that, and now they're just sitting on top. I don't know if you want to get into that or not. Well, you know, I don't talk about it in the book because I um I wanted to keep the book very solidly based. Oh yeah, we uh, get into conjecture, but I've since talked talked about things in the realm of conjecture and, and we can do that i i think it is it is important to imagine what we're dealing with and you know the 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 first thing i say is they're just people oh yeah they're not yeah. They're not lizards <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> 
people are capable of doing this stuff just people because this yeah. this has been going on for a long time um i have worked with people pretty high up in the system so i i i can imagine kind of what these people are like and i would say the people at the very top do not do anything themselves they have a support layer that does everything for them right so people at the very top of this are actually pretty helpless people without their their support yeah. so so um they 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 also the people at the very top of this as you said they've inherited this you know this is the plan for this was put in place over 50 years ago maybe longer but we can yeah. see you know the footprints of it going back at least 50 years and so there i think it's i i think it's useful for us all to to imagine that this is all happening in a sense unconsciously this is moving forward without uh, any of the individuals really understanding what's about to happen here um so we we need to uh this was the purpose of writing the book was to do it in such a way that it's not a dictionary you know it's not something it's something that's so thick that no one's ever going to read it 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 is anyone can read it in a couple of hours um they may have to read it more than once which most people do but but uh, and then it shows enough of this in an integrated way that people can see the whole of it. And the the idea is then that can travel and it is and it will go all the way up to the people at the top of the system that um, will see that they did not know this. They yeah. did not understand this. They will have the background and the sophistication to understand that it's absolutely true. This is real. It's irrefutable. And that is happening. And then they can decide, well, maybe it doesn't matter how much I'm being paid right now uh, to keep doing what I'm doing. Maybe I am more concerned about losing everything in what's about to happen so I am not going to be quite as compliant as I have been with, with the program. So, so support can start being withdrawn from this. We have to have that happen. There may be people that are close enough to the top that they can say, look, this is insane. This can't be allowed to happen. We, we, this has now reached a point that we have to uh, unwind this, we have to back to, and it, it absolutely can be, things absolutely can be done legally to um, back this down. So it it's on the one hand, you know, as you and I have, have talked already, you can look at this and say, well, it's inevitable, there has to be an awful collapse. That is true, but also the opposite is true. It is also possible that that wouldn't have to happen and that there would be ways to, to settle down the whole derivatives complex, uh, un move all of the derivatives out of the deposit-taking entities. Where yeah. The yeah, the old savings and loans versus investment banking, right? <laughs> kind of. Well, it, it's, you know, I go through this in the book that they use this exemption, you know, the, 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 the banks would have been prohibited from endangering the bank deposits, but the Fed granted them in the, it's one of the things that was done in this last financial crisis. Um, they have done a trial run of this to move, keep, keep derivatives in the, um, in the deposit taking entities, individual banks um, were authorized by the Fed to move their derivatives books that were the size of the entire global economy into their deposit taking entities. So things like that should not be allowed to happen. I mean, this, this isn't rocket science. 
No. You know, let's say, look, you could you could just explain this with non-technical terms to a class of 12 year olds and they would tell you exactly what you do what to do to unwind it just don't do that you give people back their stuff you know you know yeah. you know you have yeah, all the simple parents. concepts yeah. <laughs> that's right <laughs> you yeah. give people back their stuff these are my two tenants give people back their stuff and stop hurting people well, that's a that's a very simple and, and and it's important to have a simple message uh because if you don't like uh, the general public will have a harder time understanding it and 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 that's kind of been my whole ethos when i like because i don't come from a financial background or anything so i tried to make it very as simple as possible for the general public to understand these very uh you know heavily like think about the concepts that we looked at like i showed a couple of links there with the some of the laws that you talked about and uh you know it, it seems so far fetched from anybody to understand all what's going on but it's as simple as this for example when you like when your money is in the bank it's not yours you actually lend it to the bank like even your deposits you lend to the bank and then they could do as you said they could you know go out and and buy these derivatives contracts and do whatever they want with it and and then of course we talked about all the assets you know like stocks bonds and so on that you own within that whole, uh, you know, in their uh, custody that they have in your brokerage accounts and so on. And, and then you go to a higher level of, uh, you know, the 401ks or here in Canada, the RSPs, all of those systems, even the CPP of Canada, you know, the, the in Norway, the, the oil fund and all this stuff. Uh, it, it just becomes apparent that it's, uh, it's just a gigantic heist, basically, which I don't think anybody would really benefit from it whatsoever we're all human beings and i and i don't think anybody would really in their truest hearts if they really thought very hard about it think that this is a very good idea <laughs> yeah it's i mean that again is a very simple objective here is to show what a bad idea this is yeah. to make it very explicit and let, let people all the way to the top of the system look at it and say oh really you're really yeah. going to do this. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I, I don't know if you have any uh, any more thoughts around uh, what people could do, you know, to be able to uh, kind of fight, fight back against this and, and actually get some traction around it. Uh, like who who's people that could really have the, the biggest impact, if you can say, that really needs to get involved in this and, uh, and help making a, a change? Because this is... This is clearly a, a terrible idea. What's what's going to happen here? And uh, so, who who can who can uh, be the the great people to actually that understand things that are able to change things? Uh, and how how would you how would you perceive a, a approach to this in a in a manner that's uh, very uh, productive? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, before we started the call, I was saying, you know, people their first reaction once they understand this is panic. Yeah. And they say, well, what can I do to hide from this? How can I run from this? Even very wealthy people that um, you would think would feel a personal power and uh, to to stand up against this. The first reaction is panic. <laughs> and I think I think that's understandable. But then yeah. and and you know what? What just very quickly, you know, if you look at the depression, um, if this is something that goes on for a number of years, the main thing is to be out of debt. Just if there's stuff you have, financial assets that you could lose, you sell those and you pay off your debts. Um, but I also say to people, don't do something that will destroy your happiness destroy your marriage, destroy the lives of your children, you know, like, uh, you know, if you're in a house somewhere settled and you have a mortgage on the house and your kids are happy there, uh, you really have to, I'm not saying that you have to, uh, uh, you know, for financial reasons, destroy your happiness. But if there are things you can do that will actually reduce your stress, you can consider yeah. Doing those lots of people are going to be in debt 
they're not that they, it's going to be endemic. There are lots of people that won't be able to do anything to get out of debt, but if if it's possible. Um, so, but then coming back to what you're saying, which I agree with, the 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 is what can really be done behind beyond trying to run and hide uh, to face up to this, and it really is all a construct. None of this is even real. So they only have power over us if we just go along with it. And they say, I'm sorry, you lost everything. And we say, oh, I guess, well, I guess I lost everything. <laughs> you know, we, but, but it's, it's much better. We have to face up to this before it happens. Yeah. It's much better to do it while we have some freedom to do things. So what would that look like? Part of it is these people that are wealthy at the top of the system that are aiding, that are abetting this, that the awareness gets up to that layer. Um, I, I think it's um, very important that lawyers, prosecutors, judges, you know, the, I'm not sure what the equivalent would be in Canada, but attorney generals in states in the US, they, there are things they absolutely could do. For example, in the U.S., you just uh, address the Uniform Commercial Code in any one state. Just start and say, look, what we are t we are reversing this back to restoring property rights to people in this state. And that was also the case in Europe. This legal certainty group was charged with figuring out how to subvert national law where people had property rights, which is an ancient, ancient thing. You can't have democracy and autonomy if people don't have property rights. So it's absolutely foundational. So if, if, if people, uh, we, you know, I, I, I said to you before we got on the call, Shakespeare had said, First, let's kill all the lawyers. But actually, now we need them. We need we need the lawyers. The problem is lawyers tend to be focused on details, and this requires uh, strategy and understanding the bigger picture. Uh, but but if you can imagine that, uh, you know, a, a lawyer, a set of lawyers and a judge would become personally outraged about this. And that's what it's going to have to, it's going to have to come down to personal engagement. And then if you, if you have um, a judge that is willing to hear a suit, uh, uh, that, that's what we need is jurisdictions where actions can be brought, uh, or an attorney general that can address the law in an area. Um, I think we're on the cusp of that. I think that I think that can start happening. Yeah, I think there's. Uh, I I met a few people that are talking uh, about it, and uh, so I, I think it's just finding the right people that could pull pull something like that off, and. Um, uh, Basically, like it just comes back to like let's make things simple again. You know, we, we created such a behemoth and a very, uh, a very complex structure that doesn't have to be there. Like think about all the we were talking about the derivatives, but think about all the laws uh, that are out there that are kind of useless <laughs> in, in many ways. And and I, I I'm for like creating a very simplistic approach to you know uh, the, the law in you know where you want to live uh, and, and all this. And it, because we don't need all this uh, highly, highly complex stuff really to function as a society. We just, uh, it's just a, kind of been, been enabled by all these uh, financialization of everything um, to then just grow and grow and get bigger. And uh, like the, the whole, uh, you know, government itself, you know, feeds off creating more laws and creating more regulation and all this stuff. So I, I think people might, uh, Hopefully they'll come to the realization that be like, oh, you know, maybe uh, we just don't need these massive uh, institutions that we built and and these massive complex things. Let's go back to a, a lot more simpler things. 
Um, I don't know what you think. I, I had a little thought here. I don't know what you think about, for example, a, a corporation. Let's say a corporation go, goes bankrupt. Like usually the individuals within that corporation is protected uh, a lot of times. What, what do you think about like if you had an approach, for example, where instead of a corporation, you had a business and then that business was actually personally responsible for their own action? Uh, because I, I guess that's kind of like a part of the the the, the commercial laws and all that stuff. But um just just making people like personal responsibility for their actions within structures uh, and so on. I don't know if that uh, that makes any sense to you, but well, the the big the big problem that other people have focused on. I mean, our our deep seated problems in terms of this um, control over our lives that has to end, and it has to end because we're in open ended hybrid war that uh, clearly and so it's it's it is it it funds all the propaganda the psychological operations that are destroying our societies so yep. it's in our minds and and it's promised to be in our bodies so the and that won't it won't stop unless we stop it yep. now so so where is this control emanating from I I think it's very clear it is the private control of the central banks that has to be ended. Any other system would be uh, would better, preferable, <laughs> preferable. But yeah. the only thing that cannot be allowed is this closely held control of the money power, which then allows them to control all political parties, all governments, all militaries, all the media. But the the other part of this is, uh, um, you know, after the Civil War, the civil, U.S. Civil War gave rise to the power of corporate uh, entities and um, with the industrialization of warfare. Um, and we, we can see this uh, linkage between the banking power and warfare without the unlimited money going into these things, they would just stop. All, the, all these things that are hurting us, hurting people globally, all the, all the psyops, all the CIA operations, yeah. all that stuff with, with actual criminals, in these organizations, but they they are hurting people, uh, but they do not run things, actually. If their funding is stopped, that's so. But the the corporate power, the other part of this is the corporations are um, they were given the legal standing of persons as like a human yeah. being. And that should never be allowed. That's another thing we have to do is that only human beings are persons. Yeah, with Russia. Exactly. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's exactly what I was, uh, the direction I was going to take it there. So it's it's just important to take back like individual responsibility for your own actions. And, and then, of course, taking away the funding of the whole system itself by demolishing the, the the structures that they created for themselves to create unlimited amounts of funds to constantly make sure that they are on top uh, and, and in control of things. Like those structures are the two behemoths that uh, that really, uh, if, if you could stop the funding, you just stop everything. Like that's that's just, it, it's, it's very simple. Like they have very little power after that. The other part of this, um, you know, I'm looking at uh, Ed Griffin's uh, Creature from Jekyll Island which I had actually never read. I mean, the stuff I knew about Jekyll Island was from my my dad, um, but um, it, it's brilliant. And, uh, you know, he's a great man, Ed Griffin. I think like a saint, you know, when you see him speak. Uh, but he, early on in the book, he um, is exposing that one of the objectives of the group meeting on Jekyll Island was to stop the economy from being self-financing. Yeah. That was one of their major concerns was that the economy was becoming 
uh, increasingly self-financing without their banking control. So that tells you a lot. Yeah. They, they do not want a parallel economy. They, they would rather break the economy and weaken it as long as they are controlling it. And it's just like confiscating the gold from the public. They did not want the public uh, and the economy to be able to function without them. They would rather put us all into hard deprivation yeah. than allow them. Yeah, they're they're monopolists. That's basically what they are. They don't want competition <laughs> to their yes. to their ideas. Well, it worked. It worked. Then what they did with the Fed absolutely achieved that. So yeah. we have been living under this. Um, uh, it it is. I think we now know this is not a benevolent system. It is malevolent. Yeah. And people, the world. And people generally want benevolence. It's just like, uh, you know, no one wants war. They have to they have to work at this shit. They make it happen against the interests of people on all sides. Yeah, and I, my biggest worry about, you know, trying to stop this thing from happening is that they be like, Oh, let's because I studied a lot of currencies and their failures is that they'll take you to war and then try to blame something completely different on, you know, the their failures, their own failures, because that's really what they're trying to, you know, hide uh, is that they will go and pull that card out. And then, you know, when I, I think it's Gerald Valenti, I don't know if you know him, but he yeah. says when everything else fails, they take you to war. <laughs> Well, it's happening. Obviously, we're in it now. Yeah, yeah, we're in a yeah. global yeah. hybrid war. Uh, I think everything that happened with COVID was uh, just in a, a tactic within this global hybrid war. Um, and then that, without missing a beat, COVID stopped and Ukraine started. Yeah. And then Ukraine stopped and Gaza started. And and uh, uh, we we. You know, this is why it is urgent for this awareness to spread to the top of the system, because if if you go back and you look at what was done during World War One and World War Two, the scale of what they are willing to do in terms of the destruction um, completely unnecessarily the scale of the carnage in World War I. Yeah. And I, I think, again, going back to my, people have asked me, well, why, 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 are, why, were, you, why were you interested enough to do this with your life and to, and to write this book? Part of it is I was really, the, the adult that was most significant in my early life was my grandmother, who was Canadian, she was from the Canadian side of Lake Erie and came to Cleveland to train as a nurse and met my grandfather, who was a surgeon. And they both decided to go with something called the Lakeside Unit, which was about half Canadians and half people from the U.S. into World War I before the U.S. entered the war. And they were in... Uh, now, I... So... She sat by my bedside every night. You know, my parents were there, but she, it's the kind of thing that the old and the young have time for each other. So we yeah. spent a lot of time. And she taught me to be very capable. I could do everything and make tea and use scissors and use matches and iron and wash, you know, windows And I, when I was three. So I, I was... I, I was capable, but um, she, she didn't make me frightened by any means, but she instilled in me somehow that things could be dangerous, you know, that things could go badly. So as I mentioned in the book, she would sit by my bed at night and she was really warning me about things. And again, she she did it in a very sensitive way because she didn't frighten me. I, I was, of course, very interested. It's like the old um, um, 
children's stories where pretty awful things happened with the wolf or the fox or you know, they were, <laughs> were not sugar coated, you know. Yeah. Uh, and her stories were like that. And I, I then I have all of her things actually on an island up in Canada. I have all the family stuff up there. And uh, I go through all this material, the, you know, letters, diaries, um, business papers going going back over 100 years. And and um, I can see from her things she, I think, was pretty aware of what was going on, that something was not right <laughs> with what, what people were being told. Of course, they were heavily censored. You know, they, were, they were dealing with censorship. They were dealing with propaganda as well. And I think she knew that. And um, uh, she would have known... You know, when I was a boy, we had just gone through Bay of Pigs and then the Kennedy assassination. I think she was probably pretty concerned about what was coming. Um, so she helped me. I I knew that it wasn't all going to be fun and games in my lifetime. <laughs> that it wasn't no. wasn't just about making money and partying. Uh, <laughs> I've always I've always been. Um, concerned <laughs> yeah i think it's important to get those things i remember my grandma that used to tell me about all the experiences in world war ii in norway uh and uh the first thing that actually happened in norway was that the national socialist uh, party took over in norway during the era when when the there wasn't an invasion yet but when, what ended up happening is that they actually turned completely uh, 360 and said like okay yeah now we're uh, the nazi party now uh, in Norway, and uh, actually, head of that party was his name was Wittgen Quisling, and that name is uh, uh, in Northern Europe. It's formidable, like it's uh, looked upon as a uh, traitor. <laughs> you know, like you said, you're a Quisling, <laughs> basically. Okay. Yeah, but uh, what ended up happening is that they actually, after that, they took uh, all the private property and co uh, confiscated it. They tried to, you know, basically take uh, your gardens, destroy that. Uh, and then take any livestock that you might have had and any, you know, if you had stored up, you know, food or anything, they actually came for that first. And my grandmother used to tell me that she used to hide up in the forest and take all those animal, like a couple animals up there to hide away from when they, they went on their patrols and everything. And um, yeah, so it's, it's quite the era. And then like you think about all of that and all those stories that, you know, uh, we're lucky that our elders that lived through that have told us those stories. And then I come to, I remember watching a presentation from a, a local PhD economist here in, in Manitoba from one of the universities. And he was saying, you know what, fix the Great Depression. Uh, it's like, it was a war. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the you know, the thought pattern of uh, like these, the, he's not like the, the elite at the top, but it's like what they've gotten taught, you know, that are good, you know, good, um, uh, good answers to you know the problem <laughs> it's shockingly yeah. simplistic and yeah. uh reprehensible really unacceptable we can't no. we allow that kind of shoddy <laughs> thinking <laughs> no, can you imagine like who would in their wildest mind think that it's it's great for the economy to go and murder each other like yes. that, that is a very sick view, my point of view. Yes. Uh, yes. And, you know, but that's what you're kind of fighting against. But yeah, again, and uh, I, I think like what you're saying here is basically we need to make uh, the people aware as, as far and high as you can uh, about the, the, the per uh, perpetrations that have happened with, you know, uh, basically a, a hidden wealth confiscation that's been going on and, and tell people like how, how dumb and crazy is this? Because they are just going to keep on going, as you said. They're going to put up their central bank digital currency systems and try to, you know, even further tighten the news on people. Um, if you let uh, this continue, because there, there's no end to it. Uh, with like, you got to remember, where you're fighting against highly productive people in so, uh, certain ways. Like they're not lazy people. They they're constantly, you know, working. When when you look at all these big organizations, NGOs, and all these people everywhere, they're constantly working. And they're very hard workers, but they're working in a very wrong direction, <laughs> uh, if, if you know what I mean. So, 
Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's very important to just get out there and really try to uh, get this get this book out to everyone, guys, because uh, that is the first point. And, and of course, I think, Hera, let me see. Uh, the website is, is very simple. It's thegreattaking.com. Uh, and so everybody needs to go. Actually, the book is for free um, for uh, for people on your website, which is fantastic. So everybody should just download a copy of it. But if you do want, uh, uh, you know, the actual book, which I which I really love, because uh, as you can see, I'm I'm a collector of ideas, and I, I I do protect them. And the best way to protect them, in my view, is having them in actual, uh, you know, real things that you could then pick up and then read the uh, read through and and see all these things so uh but i i think what you do david is uh probably one of the greatest services to humanity uh somebody could ever do by uh, you know exposing this stuff and, and getting it out there uh because i think that that could be the little spark you know that uh that could really change uh the way we think as humanity and and uh, you know maybe we think you know the the current structures and and what we really we really screwed this up kind of thing yeah well, keying off what 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 you were saying about the people that are behind this, you know, they they work at it like it's their job because it is their job. They're being paid <laughs> to do it. And there's a period where that is an advantage for the totalitarian system that all these people are being paid to do it. And so they do it. But then you i think i think things reach a point where those people are only doing it because they're being paid and they are actually risk averse people they blow with the wind so if things start if they start to realize you know this could go badly for me and i'm just doing this because i'm being paid they can decline to do that Meanwhile, the rest of us who are not being paid to do what needs to be done here, we have to realize we are doing this because there's no alternative. And it reaches a point where that's like a superpower um, versus someone, you know, I, I sometimes say to people, really, do you have to be paid to do everything that you would do in life you know are is there anything that you would do without being paid to do it you know this idea that you can only do something because you're being paid <laughs> we, I mean, yeah. we, we have to we have to get we have to get beyond that that um and and it 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 does become a superpower when you know that you're doing it because you're uh um you're totally committed to it and there there are people that that are able to engage in that everybody has their threshold that they they pass through where they realize uh i i don't need to watch netflix you know i don't need more that stuff into my brain there are things i should be doing and if everybody's doing that even a little bit just moving the needle in the right direction that's what has to happen. The, 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 the other thing I want to mention, in addition to the, the book and the website, there's a documentary out now that was just put up. So that is on YouTube and Rumble. You can find links to it from the website. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share all that uh, below uh, when I post this as well. So, so some people will like, will like the, the documentary it is actually nearly as good as the book in terms of allowing people to enter into the whole thing and uh in a kind of human uh, uh narrative yeah and no, I, I think it comes down to just do what you love you know that's what you said there <laughs> i think like let's let's go back to that you know and and uh, then cut off the actually take the heart of the hydra and not try to cut off heads uh all the time uh, and uh you know uh you know i I would love to live in a place where you know people uh, just want to focus on what they love and and try to do that and think about what we can accomplish as a human species instead of you know being corrupted but really like corrupted by the system that you know currently is uh, is the operating system of Earth which is 
uh, this debt-based, you know, monetary system and financialized system. Yeah, we we can um, things can be absolutely wonderful very quickly. That's an important thing to for people yeah. begin to imagine. It's just a matter of, um, um, uh, you know, for example, if if people were told beginning tomorrow, you don't have to worry about paying income tax ever again. Now that sounds insane. We're we're so brainwashed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but of of course, you know, it didn't even exist before. You know, a little more than a hundred years ago, there were no passports. People could freely travel anywhere without a passport. The world was highly globalized, completely free trade and movement of everything yeah. before World War One. Um, uh, you know, the, it's very important that with without the linkage of the central banks with the military power and the intelligence agencies, all of this destruction stops and you then right size the government and you have to have government and you have to have, Hayek talks about this. I mean, of course we have to have planning. It's a matter of the philosophy behind it. You know, you have to, sure, you have to lay out roads and you have to you have to do things that that help the society. That's that's the key thing. That and you have to be very careful not to tip into um, a philosophy of um, that that um, ev everything has to be controlled top down. You have to recognize when that is happening and. Yep. Yeah, it's very simple. It, it all comes back to, you know, just uh, individual property rights and uh, individual responsibility, I, I really think, right? Like, it, it's very, it's kind of simple when you think about it, but people are so used to the complex current system that they're uh, kind of, you know, and they've been propagandized to be afraid of, you know, anything to that is lesser than what we have today. So, but I, I think we can change. And I think uh, everybody, and as you said, through the video here, you know, the, People that actually really can make that big change right now, you know, need to uh, get in, uh, in touch with you, David. And and if they, you know, contact me, I'll I'll make sure to get them in contact with you and and so on. So we can. I I look forward to this. I think uh, you know the it's it's good to stand up and and stop this you know dead in its making because if we don't like there, it, I've seen deep down that rabbit hole and I don't like it. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, anyways, it was, it was a pleasure having you on. Uh, just quickly, where can people uh, find find your stuff? And then we'll uh, end it. Yeah, well, the great, go to the website, thegreattaking.com. That will link you to everything uh, from there. Perfect. Yeah, let me uh, secure.